So now, make sure everything's working, and we'll move on to part two, where I have a few papers that illustrate these same points. Basically, neurons, if you, I, I say neurons, you immediately think plus one charged metals, maybe a little chloride, maybe a little calcium. So let's see how that, that works. So the brain is really specialized. Remember that you need to be quickly responding to the environment. So you need a quick element to do that. And uh, if you have a slow element, that limits the speed of your response. And so it works fine for a bacterium, works fine for a slime mold. But we need a faster element to signal for faster brains and thinking. So that's why we use those three fast ones. And then but sometimes we need something that is a little slower off, and that's when we use calcium for signaling. Now, um, before brains, what was the brain before a brain? In that sense, what contained information about the environment that allowed an organism to respond to its environment? Actually, DNA is the best answer. It's a, a chemical, but it's a, uh, information. It's a polymer of four bases. But, you know, in brains, you have a lot more capacity for information. You have all the different ions and neurotransmitters, and they're not either on or off. They're in gradients of concentration. It's more tunable, it's faster responding. Neurons can even grow or die depending on what you're learning. So hopefully your neurons are growing in these last couple of weeks before we get out of here. And uh, the, the, in DNA, there's four bases and they're joined by covalent bonds. Those are slow to break and to form. And the information is transmitted by Darwinian evolution. And so that's slow and involves a lot of organisms dying. Brains are a lot better than DNA when it comes to just responding to the environment. They're good for lots of other things as well. So this is, a, um, this is actually a flash animation that I had made for me because I was not happy with how the book did. And I just want to say, this is how neurons fire. Here's a neurotransmitter. And then a flood of sodium comes in. If you see, there's sodium ions. And then a flood of potassium goes out. And so as the plus comes in, the charge goes up, but as the plus goes out, the charge goes down. And it doesn't really matter that one's potassium, one's sodium. They balance each other in terms of charge. And that's why you have a voltage moving along the neuron. Now, at the end of it, we actually have a typo. Uh, um, he shows sodium going in, but it's not really sodium going in. The yellow things let calcium in, because the calcium moves these little bubbles of neurotransmitters to the synapse. It releases the neurotransmitters. You need calcium at the end. A little bit of calcium transport at the end allows you to do the physical movement, which is a slower process. It requires stuff actually sticking to other stuff and making physical changes in it, as opposed to simply a charge going down the neuron. So this is what I actually had in mind when I asked Gayla to draw this. And the, like, Gayla, of course, put her really cool style onto it. But I wanted to show you the real life version of it. So we are not done finding out about the brain, even uh, about brain chemistry when it comes to elements. Because I just saw this, April 2023, first of its kind signal has been developed in the human brain. And uh, there's a new kind of neuron that they found. And what they found is it doesn't use, oh, it took away my animation. I was going to have you guess. Oh, I think I went too fast. OK, you probably saw it. But I was going to have you guess. It's not sodium, it's not potassium. What's it going to be? And it's kind of a softball question because the next thing you should say is calcium or chloride. So I was going to let you decide which one it was. But here you go. When I saw this, when I saw that it was a new element, I'm like, OK, it's probably either calcium or chloride that they found. Or maybe they found zinc, you know. But that's really the only thing that neuron can do. But what's cool about these neurons is, so they use calcium to fire instead of sodium or potassium. Uh, and they actually do a XOR function, which is a computer science type term. It's a logic type term. It's the kind of computer chip component that you can make for a computer to make decisions. But we weren't aware that there was a neuron that would do that kind of logical operation. And yet, here it is. And it depends on calcium rather than sodium. I think that's cool. The data that you see for this, so as you're collecting data for data, you know, it's on the scale of seconds. And neurons are much faster. And so it's measuring, the Vicor measures, uh, you know, resonance units, 
uh, versus time. But you see a lot of stuff that look, the kind of data thinking that you do for Viacore actually can be applied to a lot of other things. This includes neurons firing. Okay, so you have the neuron firing. Uh, this is how the neurons fire. And they apply tetrodotoxin, which, um, by the way, uh, that's the toxin from the fugu fish. Have you heard about the fish? There's a fish, it's a delicacy in Japan, um, but it has a poisonous gland that has a toxin in it, tetrodotoxin. And if the chef that makes the sushi for you accidentally cuts a tiny hole in that gland, basically you'll die from eating the fish because the toxin gets into the, the, the stuff you eat. So you want the chef to be very highly trained if you're going to eat food. Um, but tetrodotoxin, the reason why it's such a potent toxin is it blocks sodium channels. Or, um, yes, it blocks sodium channels. So they applied it to these neurons, but these neurons are just fine with the tetrodotoxin. They don't need their sodium channels to fire. But instead they uh, applied cadmium. And cadmium meant that you don't, no longer get these little spikes anymore at all. They're not firing. And you see how it's completely flat. And so that means that it's a calcium-based response. I think it's a, that's kind of cool how, um, how that all works. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's what I want to show you. I want to show you how this time-based data, like what you're doing for Viacore, even if you're not doing Viacore later, there's a lot of time-based techniques that this gives you at least a basis for um, thinking about and using. All right, so you have, um, the other question is, we talked about, and this is a little thing, if you've been through Biochem 2, when we talk about smell, there's just a little thing that smell actually uses chloride instead of sodium potassium. It's kind of like, why does it do that? There's actually a paper about that. So here's smell, smell neurons, and the thing is they're in the nasal cavity, lots of mucus, lots of salt around them very different than the other kind of senses that we have, even different from taste. Um, so the, it's a different environment, much saltier than anywhere else. And their idea is that's why we use chloride. Because if you use sodium, you actually have complications for how it interacts with other elements. Here's their picture of all the transporters, and the main thing is this chloride channel is the main part of how smell neurons fire. And yet, all the other sensory neurons don't use chloride. So why do we do that? They looked at this, oh, oh and look it up here. They consider not just the ion by itself, but they consider all four ions together. And that's how they made this breakthrough. They were able to look at this, and they were able to say, oh, OK, it's in how they interact with each other. And they, they say that chloride is used. It basically makes the response robust it keeps the, um, the sodium concentration low so it can keep clearing out calcium. And so in the high salt environment, you need to prevent osmotic pressure problems. And so sodium is not good enough in the high salt, high um, uh, sort of mucus environment of the nose. So that's why you use chloride. And they modeled it. They showed if you use chloride, you have these lines are very stable next to each other, you know, depending on the concentration, the response is pretty much the same. But with sodium, look at this, this is kind of like when you have a baseline problem with the vehicle. The uh, sodium interacts with other, other parts of the system, and it just makes the, the signal to be messed up because there's external factors operating on it. So, um, and the other thing they did that's cool up, is up here, they introduced, they even put in a calcium activated sodium channel to see if calcium they had a hypothesis that maybe calcium was working in it. But uh, no, calcium doesn't work either. So you, you basically have to cross off sodium, potassium, and uh, calcium. And the ion that's left for signaling is chloride. So they found striking dif differences. Basically, the ion dynamics are coupled. Chloride cares about what the other three examples are doing. They all care about what the other three are doing. So you have to model and to ask your questions in a system with all three going on. Complex system sometimes requires different elements to be used for different jobs. So that's the answer to that. Then here's another article about how could this kind of weird signaling evolve. In this case, it's a regular old sodium channel, potassium channel interaction. 
but it's used in a different kind of sensory neuron. And if you can imagine, I don't know if there's like a, a, a superhero who can sense that, I mean like a, um, who's a superhero that can like manipulate electricity? Um, Spider-Man, the electro guy, right? So uh, he can probably sense electricity, I don't know. Um, but there are actual uh, aquatic mammals that can sense electricity. And how do they do that? Well, it's probably something having to do with their voltage-based channels. But they, uh, they actually looked and saw exactly what it is. It's actually a voltage-gated calcium channel that interacts with a calcium-activated potassium channel. And this allows voltage changes so that this little guy can detect electric fields. And they saw exactly where the changes are. They compared the electrosensing neurons, this is the wild type part, to all the other neurons. And they found that there's this part on this little loop right here. They have three lysines and glutamate and a, an arginine. Those are all really weird charges. And so they, they made the hypothesis that this allows it to respond to electric fields. This responds to voltages in the environment. And so they mutated them all the way to make a neutrally charged, just these five mutations, and it took away the, electri the electrosensing ability for, of that channel. So it seems to make reason that that could have happened in the forward direction if we can take it away. It makes sense that something like that could have happened in the forward direction to give us the electrosensing, or to give the skate the electrosensing. So that's really cool because that is basic chemistry. There's one more story I have to tell you, but I do want to break this off from the 